We're Brother Eric John Phelps back with Biblical Truth, Industry, and Prophecy. Thank you for tuning in today. By the way, you can go to my temporary website, VaticanAssassinsArchive.com. It's VaticanAssassinsArchive.com, and you can download my book. Now it's in downloadable form for 35 bucks. It's worth every penny of it, I believe. Please pray for me that I can get uh, my other side up sometime soon after it was uh, pretty much destroyed by eye power and the Jesuits running that operation. Okay, now page 464. We're going to read a quote that is really my favorite quote in my book, Vatican Assassins, and it is from my former pastor, Nelson Turner, in his book that he wrote, The Mind of the Jesuit. It is a very good book. I consider it a classic, and I'm going to quote a portion of that. It actually takes almost uh, two full pages in my book, so I'm going to quote it to you now. And here is uh, Pastor Nelson C. Turner's quotation or words from his book, The Mind of the Jesuit. Quote, The man who is a member of the Vatican Military Order of the Society of Jesus is a most unusual man. He is different from other men, not by virtue of mere membership in what may be one of the world's oldest, continually active secret societies, nor simply because he dresses in the distinctive fashion of a Romish priest. The men of the society are different from virtually all others on many counts, but the distinctions which cause them to differ from the generality of mankind are for the most part inward and are not readily observed or understood by those ignorant of the Bible and world history over the past 500 years. While the Jesuit may bear any one of a thousand faces that would go unnoticed in a crowd, he bears something spiritual that separates him from other men. His spirituality is changeable, a spirituality of apparel that makes him an actor, and yet something more than an actor. As an accomplished actor, he bears along in his mind a wardrobe of costumes suitable for the various scenes and situations that the plot of spiritual subversion spins. He is a gymnastic thespian, thespian, appearing in the guise of fatherly concern and tender charity here and coming forth as a roaring lion defending dogma there. He is a man trained to become all things to all men, quote-unquote. He does this as his motto declares, quote, for the greater glory of God, ad majorium de gloriam. He may be ensconced in the pulpit of a Presbyterian church, ostensibly upholding the doctrines of Calvin. He might be a consultant and scriptwriter in Hollywood, ah, the Jesuit theater, He might be the handler of an informational assistant to your favorite talking head on news TV. Yeah, like Bill O'Reilly. Or he may be the coach to a team of assassins who are all members of his church. Kind of like Robert Philip Hansen's and and that uh, Opus Dei Church there in Virginia, where Louis Free and Hansen's went to. Whatever he may be, the Jesuit can be anything, and yet is nothing. He is whatever he is told to be. And if he is a good Jesuit, quote-unquote, that is all he ever will be. To find the mind of the Jesuit, we must have the mind of Christ, but find the mind of Satan. To know the mind of the Jesuit is to know the mind of the devil. No soul can rightly comprehend the, quote-unquote, mystery of iniquity, unless he first partakes of, quote, the mystery of godliness, unquote. The Jesuit, as a Roman Catholic priest, will consistently preach the doctrine of free will of man, but he, to be what he is, has already totally relinquished control of his body, soul, possessions, conscience, and future life to his superior. He deems himself to be without a will of his own, Nothing more than a, quote, a stick in a, the hand of an old man, unquote. While he promises men liberty through the use of their, quote, unquote, free will, he himself is the servant of corruption. His will is never his own. 
but it has been extinguished by the will of his commanding officer. His mind has been brought to or passed over the brink of insanity repeatedly through the lifelong repetitious spiritual exercises and retreats where he wipes clean the slate of conscience and the spark of humanity through obsequious idolatry. Obsequious, obsequious idolatry. I have to look that word up. His heart, black by name, is polished in the luster of a lamp of shiny coal, and when it is tossed into the furnace of ordered action, will ignite to red and then glowing white heat in a most vehement manner. His best motions are for the worst purposes, and his greatest victory is the defeat of every pang and qualm of conscience within himself and those whom he has appointed to incite to evil. As the scriptures say, quote, the devil has come down unto you having great wrath. Revelation 12:12. 12, 12. So then, what is the mind of the devil? The devil doesn't come to man to elevate him, but to hold him fast in the chains of fallen flesh and provoke him to further defilement through the promise of an illusory liberty ordained through self-will or obtained through self-will. The devil savors the things that, he, that, that are of man and detests those that be of God. He promotes the free will of man but deplores the will of God. He loves the power and arm of the flesh and hates the work of the Spirit. The devil loves hate and hates love. He will do well to no man but would make all men his servants, promising promotion to those that obey him. He leads them along an ever-sinking path to a reward of eternal conscious pain, a recompense which is meat to those that are so used to him, used of him, so meat to those that are so used of him. Promising to heal, he wounds and destroys, his blessings being all curses. He loves worship to be rendered unto him, but returns no worship to the God that created him. He is ever active and does much that looks good. But in his wake is a trail of corpses, collapse, and consternation. He professes to promote piety while praying blasphemies, and drives the wicked headlong with the counsel of their free will. He begins where most men would stop and never pays the bill for the mischief which his blandishments have enticed others to commit. The sins and crimes he moves men to engage in become their own, and he smugly watches as they are taken and bound with cords, cheerfully ignoring their shrieks of terror and pain. The tear of sorrow, the pangs of remorse, or regretful looking back are all unknown to the devil, and these com common human emotions are absent in the good Jesuit. Compassion is in the mouth but not in the heart of the Jesuit. And his speeches about charity, unity, and equality are formed to drop a certain, a curtain of confusion over the mind of his hearers. When he speaks to men, they hear one thing, but he secretly means another. While he enunciates with embellished eloquence desires for peace and love, it is war that is in his heart. Good words and fair speeches pour forth from his feigned lips as he drowns his opponents with rhetoric devoid of truth and empty of righteousness. All is emotionless calculation with these workers of iniquity, so much that all outward and visible displays of emotion by the Jesuit are insincere and formulated to elicit the desired responses from his opponents. He never shows his true self because he has no true self. His ways are changeable, that one cannot know them. Yet he has no changes and fears not God. He is a man of mystery, a puzzle of a person who carries under his cloak a double heart that makes him heartless. A double heart that makes him heartless. He reaches into the heights of craft and knowledge as he plumbs the depths of depravity and ever trawls the murky waters for sin, of sin for a prize. Indeed, he ever trawls the murky waters of sin for a prize. 
unquote. The mind of the Jesuit, the pastor Nelson Turner. Truly a poetic yet incisive and vivid description of the mind of the Jesuit and his master, the devil. Well, this is the Jesuit. These are the men that rule the world. These are how they think. These are the minds that they possess. Remember, to become a professed Jesuit of the third vow takes 15 years of quote-unquote education. 15 years after high school. And when they're ready to go, they can handle anything. They can handle politics. They can handle economics. They can handle academia. They can handle religion. They can handle anything. And if they personally can't handle it, there's somebody else they know who can. Because it's a military brotherhood. And you call your greatest soldier in a specific area to the forefront, to the battle arena, to contend for the order on this particular instance. It's a military order. Now, do you think a free country can exist with these kinds of men in it? Do you think a free nation with a constitutional limited government can last with men like this living in it? They've sworn the destruction of the Reformation. It's called the Counter-Reformation. They regard America as a heretic nation. Not anymore. Now it's just an atheistic, godless nation full of sin and wickedness. Easy prey for the Jesuits. Can you take these kinds of people in your country? Or are you going to call for their expulsion? As did Russia in 1820 at the hand of their virtuous Tsar Alexander I. Will you call for Jesuit expulsion as was done in Germany in 1872 by the virtuous Prince Otto von Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor? Will you call for their expulsion as did the great Queen Elizabeth on four separate occasions after they tried to kill her in the Rodolfi plot, in the Babington plot, and a host of others. Will you call for their expulsion, as did that great Queen Bess? Will you call for their expulsion, as did the great Oliver Cromwell, when he drove them out of England, out of Great Britain, and called for priest hunting? Because they're the ones that had drenched the land with blood with the Stuarts and conspiracies in the Parliament, as we have conspiracies in our Congress today. When are we white men going to wake up and start doing what our white forefathers did in historic Protestant and Slavic nations? I mean, even you black men that are listening. Remember Ethiopia. That the great nation, the black Christian nation of Ethiopia, it was not Roman Catholic, it was Bible-believing for many years. The Christian nation of Ethiopia went in 1663, expelled the Jesuits. The only black nation that I know of that ever expelled the Jesuits, and for that reason I believe God did not allow them to be colonialized. The slave trade didn't go into Ethiopia. And the scramble for Africa from 1885 to 1914, 1915, for 30 years, they never once touched Ethiopia. You see, that's what happens, my black friends. When you believe the Bible, God begins to start protecting you from this white power structure run by the Pope of Rome. Well, that's the mind of the Jesuits. But let's let's read a little more by another great historian, James A. Wiley, who wrote a three-volume set titled The History of Protestantism. And in volume two, we read a some some 50-page description of the Jesuit order and their counter-reformation. And here's a portion of it. Here's what he wrote in 1878, James A. Wiley. So far as we have traced the enrollment and training of that mighty army which Loyola had called into existence for the conquest of Protestantism? Let us survey the soldier of Loyola as he stands in the complete 
and perfect panoply his general has provided him with. How admirably harnessed for the battle he is to fight. He has his loins girt about with mental and verbal equivocation. He has on the breastplate of probabilism. His feet are shod with the preparation of the secret instructions. <laughs> Above all, taking the shield of intention and rightly directing it as he is able to quench all the fiery darts of human remorse and divine threatenings. Remember, the Jesuit has no conscience. Remember, Robert De Niro, uh, he's a knight of Malta, and he is a most sincere Jesuit brother. And he plays the part of the devil in Hollywood. He's also played some other horrible parts. He and Al Pacino are two good Jesuit brothers. Having no conscience, having no remorse, having no fear of God, and portraying all this wickedness on a Hollywood Jesuit screen so we can copy it. This is the good Jesuit of Hollywood. He takes, quote, for an helmet, the hope of paradise. And I add, as do the post-Muslim hordes, unknowingly serving the order as a sword of the church, now to be used against the West. Indeed, this hope of paradise, which has been most surely promised him as the reward of his services. And in his hand he grasped, grasps the two-edged sword of a fiery fanaticism wherewith he is able to cut his way with prodigious bravery through truth and righteousness. You know who's the good Jesuit in the, in the Congress? In the American Congress? The Speaker of the House, John Boehner. He's the good knight of Columbus, a good Jesuit oath of the fourth vow, and he's the one that brought that Jesuit chaplain, chaplain into the American House of Representatives. John Boehner's a Jesuit. When are you going to wake up, folks? Continuing. Indeed, in his hand he grasped the two-edged sword of fiery fanaticism. Party spirit. Sean Hannity. Bill O'Reilly. Versus Lawrence O'Donnell and Chris Matthews. All of them Jesuit coadjutors in their fiery reporting and castigating one another bringing us to the place that we don't know what to believe. Well, here's what you believe. They're all a bunch of Jesuit coadjutors, and none of them have any real solutions for you. White men. The solution for us white men, as calculated by these centers, is right-wing fascism. That's where they want to drive us to. But we're not going there, as far as this broadcast is concerned. Wherewith he is able to cut his way with prodigious, with prodigious, with prodigious bravery through truth and righteousness. Verily, the man who has to sustain the onset of soldiers like these and parry the thrusts of their weapons has need to be mindful of the ancient admonition. Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Ephesians 6.13 While slowly and steadily climbing up to the control of kings and the government of kingdoms, that's what's happened here, folks. The Jesuits have taken over the American government as of March 9th, 1933. They instituted a coup d'etat, and they imposed a de facto military government on that date. 3933, March 3rd, 1933. You add those numbers together, 3, 9, and 3. 3 and 3, and you come up with 18. You divide that by 3, and you got 666. Six, six. Yeah. The occult meaning of March 9th, 1933, is the Jesuit order and their 666 symbol taken over the American government to use it as a military sledgehammer on all the nations of the world to reduce those governments to military dictatorships subject to the Pope of Rome. Mm -hmm. yeah. they are to study great modesty of demeanor and simplicity of life 
The pride must be worn in their heart, not on the brow. And the foot must set down softly, that is, to be planted at last on the neck of monarchs. That's exactly what happened to John F. Kennedy on November 22, 1963. He experienced the Jesuit sentence of death pursuant to the doctrines of regicide of the Jesuits Salmeron, Molina, Rodriguez, Balsambaum, Bellarmine, all these evil, wicked, sinful Jesuits. Francisco Sarez calling for the destruction of quote-unquote usurpers. And you see, a usurper in the mind of the Jesuit is a political leader who doesn't go along with the program of, of serving the Pope and oppressing his people, either economically or in actuality. That ours, that are in the service of princes, say the instructions, that's the secret instructions of the Jesuits, keep but a very little money and a few movables contenting themselves with a little chamber, modestly keeping company with persons of humble station. And so being in good esteem, they ought prudently to persuade princes to do nothing without their counsel whether it be in spiritual or temporal affairs, quote-unquote. Do you think the mulatto, pawn of the Jesuits, Barry Davis Obama, do you think he makes his own decisions? He can hardly engage in conversation. He surely can't engage in debate. He surely can't off-the-cuff refute an attacker. So why is he there? He's there to speech. He's there to give calculated speeches to impress the, the easily deceived, while at the same time to be the calculating agent of the Jesuits running Washington. So through the things that he does, white men will be incited to hate all black men in this country. And it's working. The Jesuits want to incite a race war with Barry Davis Obama. And he's already incited on the black side. You got this, the new Black Panthers, you know, they, they're, they're going to interfere in the election down there in Philadelphia. And Eric Holder, that mulatto, he's not going to prosecute those black sinners because, you see, he's working with the new Black Panthers. And good old Shabiz, the head of it, he's the black Prince Hall right Freemason, just like Farrakhan and Jesse Jackson and L. Sharpton and all those other boule boys working for the Pope of Rome, betraying their own black people here in America. That's why you righteous black men need to support me. You need to help me. Because I'm helping you. You minority civil black people, you're going to be set up for your mass murder because this Jesuit white power structure is using Barry, Mulatto Barry and Mulatto Eric Holder to incite white rage against you. And the political party that will be the foundation for that, I believe, is that Roman Catholic led Tea Party. More and more white men of all religious persuasions are flocking to the Tea Party and we're suckers. We ought to be calling for separation from Washington, D.C. and the establishment of our own countries. But oh no, the Jesuit in his mind of, of persuasion and manipulation, he is the master of ceremonies, he's the master of contingency, and he's going to work all things after the purpose of the order. And he'll have men in positions of power on the right and on the left. I was just watching a video today of a guy showing that uh, this one particular man who is connected with the CIA is busy financing Ron Paul. They got both sides, folks. They got it all. And why wouldn't they? Because they've got all the churches that are 501c3 and using anything but the King James Bible. This is the mind of the Jesuit. And they believe they have the right to advise any political leader, kings, queens, presidents, dictators, as to their Temporal power is how they're going to rule their country, which includes our persecution and our extinction, unless the Lord intervenes. 
Brother Eric John Phelps, thank you for tuning in today. I have a book, Vatican Assassins. Go to my website, vaticanassassinsarchive.com, and order a copy. Please pray for me 60 seconds a day that the Lord would use me to minister to you on every Monday and that the other brethren would minister to you Tuesday through Friday. Please pray that uh, the Lord would uh, intervene and send us a fourth great awakening. Please pray for Liberty Radio Live, Brother Nicholas Arthur. You might continue to host these programs. And may the Lord bless you. The rest of the Till then, Maranatha.